Hey everybody, welcome to the Nomer Podcast. Russ Mangson here with my guest Allison Chisholm, a professional copywriter based out of central Massachusetts, uh, one of our great connections and referral partners, and we share some clients and so we wanted to bring her on the podcast to spotlight her business and talk to you guys about the importance of copy on today's episode, so stay tuned. Hey, Allison. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks for making your way down to Pawtucket and, and coming into the NAMR studio. It's good to see you. It's great to see you, Russ. Thank you. And I'm closer. very glad to, to be on your podcast. This is exciting for me. Absolutely. So for the folks um, listening, we'll go into sort of how we know each other a little bit. You were one of the first people that I met when, I, we, when we first started NAMRA and I started networking in Worcester and all the you know Central Mass chambers. Um, and we have uh, eventually shared some clients, passed some referrals back and forth. And so, um, you know, it's, it, this is, you're our first official, like strictly copywriter who's ever been on the show. So yeah. it's, it's good to have you on and hopefully we can teach some people about copy today. Sounds good. It's an honor to be your first <laughs> writing, uh, guest. That's great. So let's start with telling everybody what exactly it is that you do. Like, what does a, a proposal look like from somebody who, who just does the copy? So the proposal actually uh, tries to explain what the strategy is behind the writing. So it's typically something that explains the goal for the, uh, the project, how we're going to accomplish that, by which objectives are we trying to achieve, and then what are the strategies that will achieve those objectives. Then we get down to the tactics. That's where we talk about more specifics, what we're going to be doing, what we will be producing. Um, but it, we don't get to that level until we've gotten clear on what are the outcomes we're looking for, what is the business objective. Because if the writing is not in support of the business plan, it's, you know, frankly, don't do it. Um, writing just for writing's sake is really not uh, the point of marketing communications. Mm -hmm. So what are those conversations typically look like from the top level down when you're talking just because we have similar conversations like top level down on the social media side. But I'm curious what you guys talk about when you're thinking about just is it. Well, I guess it depends on where they're at in business. Right? Of course, of course. I mean, and sometimes I'm working with a client who's done their all their marketing themselves. And they're just not, they're finally at a point where they're ready to let go. Mm -hmm. Let somebody else do it so they can focus on their business. Uh, if there's somebody who's worked with other marketing agencies before, then it's a different kind of conversation. But really, my first questions for them before we get to the proposal stage is, what are you trying to accomplish? What does success look like for you? How will we know we're getting where you want to go? Uh, because until we know the destination, we really can't show you the path. So mm -hmm. I love it. Let's talk about um, copy for the website because that's like the first thing that needs to be done, right? You start a business, you get a website. And what am I writing on the website? How do you work with people through that process? Because I, I truly think copy is like the foundation of the entire brand. Aside from the logo, yeah. which we do, sure. that writing about the business in a professional way, clearly explaining the services you offer, the value that you bring to the table, all that information that ends up on the website is super important and needs to be written properly not only professionally, like with no typos, but towards a specific goal. And so how does that process usually work? I mean, it's, this sounds very basic, but we talk about the audience. Who are you trying to reach? And that helps determine the, basically the approach, the tone of the content. I work very hard to make it sound like it's coming from the business owner, that this is not choice words version of what they should be saying. It's, our interpretation of how they would be describing things so that if they meet someone face to face after that person has visited their website, there's no, you know, it, it sounds the same. It's authentic. Um, if they are somebody who tends to get very high level and sort of edu speak, professional nerddom, mm -hmm. um, we may have to tone it down just a little bit. Uh, but we really have to start with. Who are you trying to reach and how do they take in information? And that may lead to a lot of other questions about how they normally interact with their prospective customers, um, what people tend to expect from them. If they've been in business a while, 
They've got a brand. They have a voice. I just want to make sure that our work matches what they're doing so that it all comes together as a consistent set of messages. I love that. And I think that really speaks to the intimacy that you build with each one of your clients because you can't write in somebody's voice if you don't know them, right? So there's a lot of companies out there like in a different state who will more than happily write you very templated cookie cutter content, right? It's generic. It's the same on our end with like the posting side of things, the video editing side of things. You know, you can, you can find somebody for cheap far away who will, who will get it done. Right. Or you can work with somebody who really knows you and knows your voice and can consistently put that voice out there on your behalf in a professional way that you don't have to worry about it. You're actually confident and happy with what's going out. So Uh, that's why I wanted to bring you on. That's, I think the main reason that you separate or main way you separate yourselves from other copywriting options out there. I appreciate that, Russ. Thank you. But also it's, it's not just posting consistently, it's posting in a strategic way. So whatever the con, however the content is showing up and yes, it starts with the website. Um, you want to make sure that it's fitting into the overall messaging calendar, the, you know, they're, you're not just throwing words out there to say, oh, okay, I got it done for today. Um, are the words actually doing something? Do they have a purpose? And um, as you and I have spoken about before, the tagline for my company is words with a purpose. Um, words by themselves are wonderful, but unless they're actually pointing towards a target, if they have some purpose behind them, uh, that makes them worthwhile in my estimation. I love it. I love it. And one of the other things that we often talk about with like on the social media side is how as much as the technology evolves and we won't go into that side of things yet, we'll save that for the end of the podcast. But as technology evolves, marketing principle principles remain the same. You know, the, the tried and true stuff does remain the same, like analyzing the audience effectively and making sure your messaging really relates to the audience and it's stuff that they want to read about or stuff that they want to see on a video. So I love all of that. How has the platforms uh, or how, yeah, how has the changing of the platforms sort of like made your career evolve? Like what were you doing when you first started writing versus what you're doing now? Excellent question. Because I, when I first started writing, it was Probably before you were born, Russ. And I don't like to say that too often because <laughs> that can make me seem like Methuselah. But really, my first assignments when I first was working was I was writing brochures. They were going to be printed. They were going to be handed out. Uh, one was one of my first projects was a mini history of the New York Clearinghouse, which is where thirteen major banks in New York City would come together and they would literally take paper checks and dump them out from bags onto a big table, and they would start sorting them. So somebody's client, you know, one bank went to, all the clients from one bank went one way and and another, and they sorted it out and they cleared the checks. Um, So that's what they were doing starting in the 19th century Mm -hmm. and into the 20th century, and at the time I was writing it, there was this new thing on the horizon that was going to involve computers Mm -hmm. and electronic banking just on the edge. So I think they wanted to capture some of the history before all that changed. Um, And I was working with a designer so that my words would look beautiful, but the designer was creating things with different layers of paper. And so you could see how the images would look, but there were no computer screens involved Mm -hmm. in that process. It was all beautiful, but it was art uh, rather than anything digital. Mm -hmm. Um, I went from that to doing press releases, trying to reach the media. That really hasn't changed at all. It's just the way you deliver the press release. Mm -hmm. We're no longer messengering them across town to get to the publication. Um, You know, but the tried and true news content where you want to put the most important thing first and go down from there, that hasn't changed. Um, It's in fact, it's gotten even more important because people will only read like the top line and nothing below that unless you're making those first 10 words really, really worth sticking with. Right. So what was the headline is a subject line, and you want to get people to continue reading. They're just looking at a screen instead of on paper. Yeah, I love that. So you were not always writing for other businesses. I was working for a PR agency. So our specialty was corporate and financial public relations, 
we tended to have Fortune 500 clients. One of the things that they hired us for was uh, to protect them if there was any kind of a hostile takeover situation. So they're publicly traded. Um, this was in an era where there were a lot of people trying to influence the stock price, take over the board, change the way the, the company was run, and the current owners didn't always want that. Uh, so they would run big, big ads in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, um, all on paper. And wow. yeah. Um, what a high stakes place to start, huh? It was. It was. <laughs> um, although I was typically working on clients that were not uh, going through the throes of a hostile takeover. It was just really bread and butter communications. You want to get you know coverage in the in publications. Um, you want to make sure if they're creating uh, materials, sales materials, that it's all consistent, fits in. They weren't calling it fitting in with the brand, but it was definitely fitting in with the corporate messaging. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And so how did it evolve into doing work for smaller, medium-sized businesses and helping with like website copy and things like that? What was the evolution there? So the evolution was um, I left New York. I moved up to central Massachusetts, um, worked for both Harvard and then UMass Medical School. And after those stints, um, I actually had two kids. And I, with the second one, I thought, you know, I think it's time to work for myself. So I started my own business in 1996. Um, and that's where I worked for previous employers, but also I could offer consistent messaging uh, opportunities to small and medium-sized businesses. So I've always said I work in business, education, and healthcare because those are the three areas that I have the background in. Um, and then I throw in manufacturing because I work with manufacturers a lot. Um, I had a, one client for 15 years. So I, I kind of understand that world. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, again, a testament to your experience in that like you have, you're honest with your audience about like what industries you should be working in based on what you're equipped to write about. Exactly. <laughs> and a lot of people overextend and find themselves in treacherous waters, yeah. you know, and you're not that way. You know? I try not to be, I try not to be, although there's always something new around the corner. Sure. Um, and I'm happy to learn. Uh, one of the things that I have learned though, is really for choice words, it's business to business. That's mm -hmm. really our, our strength. Um, awesome. we're, we're not, overwhelmingly consumer based. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And so let's talk about like individual services, right? So there's website copy, mm -hmm. blog writing. Sure. What so else? Social media posts, LinkedIn posts, um, annual reports. Um, and I've actually written two books. So we're talking about, you know, things that are a hundred words or the first book I wrote was 420 pages. So, um, for a client? For a client. Wow. They, I'd That's been, really cool. I'd been writing um, their employee newsletter and their press releases. I'd been writing marketing material for them. And the uh, chief executive officer, Emeritus, came up to me and said, you can write. Why don't you write about the founder of the company? who wow. The company was founded in 1888. So um, I had never written a biography before. I love writing about people, but... Normally, those were magazine length, not book length. Mm -hmm. And so it became an exploration of his life. And he was in his 50s when he started the company. So he'd had a whole life before that that wasn't with the company that hired me to write about him. But in order to really give the story of his life uh, meaning, I had to talk about his life from the beginning. He was born in 1831. Wow. There were, not, there were no typewriters. There were no notes to read you know, for the first 40 years of his life. So I read a lot of letters in 19th century handwriting. I wow. Read diaries. Um, letters that were their, their version of carbon copy paper uh, back in the day. They'd write something and press onion skin against the ink that had just been used to write the letter. <sighs> and that would take a copy, and that copy would go in a copy book. Wow. Um, if any water got anywhere near it, you couldn't read the words. So you'd read a sentence like, enclosed is a photograph of, and then it would be washed away. <laughs> I love Just it. Just couldn't, couldn't figure out what they were talking about. Wow. 
But so that was so that's the longer version of what I can write because you're examining not just the company and the company's founding, but the person behind the company and their whole life philosophy, which naturally enough, you know, was infused in the company that he started. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's so cool. What was the other one? So the second one, um, actually, I got that assignment as I was literally sending to press the first one. Hmm. And this was for uh, a man who basically re-engineered engineering education. He was an electrical engineer who was working for WPI, Worcester Polytechnic Institute. And they needed to change the way they were teaching their engineers. The old ways were not working anymore. Um, It was the 60s. There were a lot of new ways of thinking about education. Um, And engineering was really important for the United States to re-examine because we'd had what people called our Sputnik moment, where the Russians got a a rocket ship uh, before we did. And this started JFK's moonshot and, you know, Mm -hmm. get a man on the moon. Well, you needed the engineers to do all the work that was required to figure out how you get a man to the moon. Mm -hmm. So uh, WPI was in the throes of trying to figure out how to reconfigure what they were doing. And uh, they came up with something called the plan. And the plan took a typical two-semester academic year, broke it into four seven-week terms. So basically, try and teach what was normally in a semester in half the time, with twice as many classes. But other, also, they were um, very early on uh, doing videotaping of classes And they were really trying to get the students to learn more independently. So if they needed to know something in order to accomplish an engineering task, it was up to them to figure out what they needed to go back to and what those sort of foundational lessons were for them to learn. So this was shocking. This was very different. And the guy I was writing about, a guy named Bill Grogan, um, needed to sell the plan had to get buy-in from the faculty because nothing happens in a university without faculty approval. And he needed a two-thirds vote. Um, he was, it wasn't going to be a success in his mind if he didn't have two-thirds of the faculty to vote on it. It was 1970. And the way he was, as he called himself, an Irish politician. And he worked up, down, and sideways. He was talking to trustees. Trustees were talking to faculty members. And when it came down to the final vote, the pivotal votes were made by the faculty in physical education. They had voting rights, and WPI students today will actually have to take PE classes because that was the deal that Bill Grogan brokered back in 1970 to get their votes to pass the plan. And it's changed somewhat um, over the years, but really since 1970, WPI has been teaching their engineers Um, in this whole different way, which involves more independent work. Um, Project-based learning is their claim to fame, and that was really born in 1970 with this plan Hmm. that was envisioned with a committee, but essentially brokered and then managed by Bill Grogan because he became the dean that then had to implement the plan. Hmm. It's great to vote it in, but then you've got to make it work. Um, And that was the rest of his career at WPI. He was the Dean of Undergraduate Studies for another 20 years, just over 20 years after the plan was voted in. So it's a life of what he did up to the plan as a, you know, as a child. I, and I interviewed about four dozen of his family and friends to get the full story um, because he, Bill had been trying to write it for years. And at the time I was brought in to, to do the book, um, he was in his later years and his stories were starting to change. His memories were changing. And the people who had heard him tell these stories over the years said, it's not the same anymore. So to bring it back to more of a fact-based biography, they brought me in, and I just interviewed around him. And I spoke with him as well. Mm -hmm. Um, But he passed away before the book was finished. Oh, that's too bad. It was, except that he left a lot of papers to WPI. So it gave me more material to go through that I think helped make the, filled in the story a a little bit more in ways that uh, maybe he might not have remembered to tell me or just like letters to his mother from 1945 as he's leaving um, the army, you know, and, oh, excuse me, he was in the Navy as he was uh, 
basically finishing his last assignment after World War II. He was writing his mom about what he was doing. I'm not sure that I would have gotten those letters um, directly from him. So, But it just filled in so many wonderful details about his life. And frankly, that's what I try and do, whether it's a short piece or a long piece, is find the telling detail. Find the thing that's going to really tell the story for you um, using the words of the people that I'm working on behalf of. Because um, I don't want to make it up. We, we want to be honest here and yep. authentic. And if you can find a way that summarizes what they're trying to accomplish, you know, in a sentence or a paragraph, if you've got that much flexibility, that tells the story. That connects with the reader in ways that I can only come up with so much. You know, it's really got to come from the sources. Mm-hmm. So, and Interesting. It's, it's a delight when it works. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We always say, you know, the goal, like obviously you're, you're gathering tons of information about whatever subject it is, but the goal is to find that one thing that is really going to resonate with people. So is it the same when you're writing a book? Like there should be one overarching thesis sort of, and then each chapter sort of builds to that, or is each chapter a totally separate thing? It depends how they've lived their lives. And I, as I'm sure you know, no one's life is only about one thing. You know, right. We're evolving, we're changing, we go through different stages. And so both people that I wrote biographies about went through those stages right. as well. Um, but particularly with Bill Grogan, there were a number of things that were just sort of rock solid values for him. And so I think that coming back to those values, we actually had a couple of appendices that were essentially his life philosophy because he'd shared a lot of advice over the years with fraternity brothers. Um, and he re-engineered some fraternities along the way too. Oh. It wasn't just academics. Wow. And so sort of the wisdom of Bill is at the end of the book. And it's just some things like that are like when you're traveling, um, every opportunity you have to use the bathroom, go right ahead. That was, that was one of his solid pieces of advice, you know, yeah. and I'm like, makes sense to me so um i wouldn't say there's one theme for a life but there's sort of a core set of values and i think that's very true for a company as well Mm -hmm. whatever they're writing about it should be resonating with what they are claiming as their vision their values and so it's it's similar it's just a different format yep what do you think's harder writing ten thousand words or 100 words on a subject (sighs) Um, I was just trying to write a a hundred word (laughs) uh, description of a presentation for a client. A hundred words can be very hard because you have to uh, have the the reader fill in a lot of the blanks. Um, So it's got to be a hundred of the right words. Mm -hmm. So there's a, you know, a age old story about I, it took, I didn't have extra time, so I couldn't write you a short letter. Yep. And I forget if that was Ben Franklin who said it or somebody else, but. I want to say you're right. I feel like I've heard that very recently, yeah. Probably Ben Franklin. He's a good one it's for probably quotes. totally not Ben Franklin. And we're, somebody's going to, somebody out there will fact check us. <laughs> I'm sure they will, and I, I look forward to that. 10,000 words can take a long time to write. Mm. Um, it was the Bill Grogan book was two years. Mm. You can't take two years to write 100 words, but. There's just a lot. It's a diff- so it's a different kind of thinking. Mm-hmm. Um, but it comes down to the same things where what is going to connect with your reader? What is going to make sense? Uh, and you have to avoid going into the weeds, even in a book, mm-hmm. because there's a lot of stuff that I, I found out that was really exciting, particularly about the 19th century guy. So much interesting historic background couldn't go in the book you know Mm. it would have been twice as long yeah yeah i was just gonna say that like i'm sure every even like 500 page book could have been twice as long before they trimmed all the fat and easily wild yeah 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 i have heard that though like it's yeah didn't have time wrote you a long letter or whatever it was yeah exactly because it takes time and thought to be concise and so i it happens a lot Clients will say, oh, well, it's only 100 words. That Mm -hmm. shouldn't take you very long. Yep, we hear that a lot. Like, (laughs) oh, just quick caption. It's like, well, okay. (laughs) (laughs) It's, but do you want, do you want quick? Do you want correct? Correct? Do you want authentic? Yep, yep, exactly. What are your tips for 
writing uh, a great blog? I mean, I know we've talked about the audience, but do you have any like, um, let's start with just writer's block. Like how do you actually just map out all the ideas? Once, once you idea dump with the client and you get all the information, what's your roadmap look like for, you know, I'm going to write all the copy for the website, make a bunch of blogs. How does it, how does it look? Well, with blogs, you have to have a plan because every blog has to stand on its own, but they really should be connected to an overall plan. So if we're blogging about one particular service, okay, make sure that you've got the next cert, the next blog is about the next service. Or if you're talking about a process, the first blog can be about how you start. The next blog can be about what happens next, you know? And so you don't try and stuff everything into one blog um, because no one wants to read that. And you want to give them something to think about and then look forward to finding out more in the next mm-hmm. blog. But really, I mean, for a, a blog like any other piece of writing, you need to have a good lead. You have to start with something strong mm-hmm. that maybe get them to get the reader to kind of shake their head and say, what? Um, be con- a contrarian a bit, you know, mm-hmm. tell them something they hadn't expected. Yeah then hopefully they'll read the second sentence because you just can't expect people to look at something or a long block of copy, break it up. Um, I mean, sometimes I think of blog writing um, like poetry because you're trying to come up with something that sounds good, that sings well, sort of in the reader's mind. And it doesn't have to be long, but it has to say what you need to say in the most concise way possible. Mm -hmm. Now, there are two schools of thought. There are the blog writers who think, well, I don't want to belabor this. I want to give them what they want, but I don't want it to be 1,500 words. And then you've got the people who say, if it's not 1,500 words, it's not going to be considered quality work Mm -hmm. or authentic. Um, I tend to be in the first school where I think not, not impossibly short, but shorter is better because I think you have a better chance of somebody actually finishing what you wrote. Mm -hmm. Um, If the purpose of the blog is to be very instructional and you're essentially giving them like, you know, a chapter, a lesson, all right, then you need to give it the the word count that it needs to to be done properly. Mm -hmm. But under, you know, you're kind of assuming you have the audience that's going to retain for that. Uh, If if they're there, they're there for... more detailed information they'll stick with you right same thing with videos Mm -hmm. people are like well what's better a short video or a long video i said that's a very loaded question right who are your audience like who's your audience what video are we talking about are we talking about a little promo or is it your long form educational video because if it's good enough you'll watch a three-hour keynote speech from like a motivational speaker you love or a marketing person you love or so if the content's good you'll you'll watch it no matter how long or you'll read it no matter how long but if it's if it should have been more concise, you should probably make it as concise as possible. Yeah. You know, if you feel like you're getting wordy or fatty, that's when you want to trim, trim, trim. And just, you know, have pity on the poor reader. Um, yeah. The, yeah. This Pretend is not, you're reading it. <laughs> this is not the only thing they're doing all day. Right. Um, and I'm just as guilty as the next person. If I can see that a video is longer than I'm ready to give it, mm-hmm. I'll look for the transcript. You know, is there a way I can do this faster without sitting and watching it? Yeah. How have you seen the, uh, like incentive to create an awesome lead? Like that first sentence that actually captures people. Volume of content is through the roof, obviously in recent years, (laughs) there's no doubt about that. Right. So everything's getting way more clickbaity because there's way more competition. So like there's even an art to like the YouTube thumbnails and the YouTube titles and every, like every little caption on social media is people are really, really getting good. Like the big YouTubers know all of their analytics, like this subtitle worked, this, you know, this title didn't work well Mm -hmm. and this thumbnail. So how much have you seen that be impacted over the years as like the volume of just content in general has increased? I, again, it just, it goes back to the audience. If the audience has changed, then Mm -hmm. the way you reach them is going to have to change. Um, I've had some clients for a number of years And the audience really hasn't changed all that much. Hopefully there's more of them, but it's just not, um, they, they know what they want to hear or read. uh, And that's what we try and give them. So I don't know. I can't say that it's changed just in the sense that 
everybody's bombarded with information. Mm -hmm. You have to make it clear right away that this is information that they are going to value. Mm -hmm. Um, That's good. It hasn't forced you to like compromise the integrity of like, and just be clickbaity, you know? No, and we, no. we, it's, we I mean, do the same thing. Like we always recommend like, don't like, you got to be you. You right, need to be right. authentic and give your version of good information. You can't start to worry about what's trending this week. Cause it's going to change anyway. Yes. So it's really yeah. more about consistency and authenticity over a long period of time than it is like hopping on the newest trend or like sure. grabbing them now. Well, if the nature of the information um, is something that leads to top five treatment, and that's literally what the story is about, I'm not afraid of doing that. Right. If it's going to get people to actually pay attention to the information. Mm -hmm. But the the content, even in like a subject line, if it's an email, um, you have to make sure that it's relevant to them. Right. Because well, at the end of the day, it's long. You're building long-term rapport with the audience. So right. even one time, if you click a link where the article isn't about what that title said, yeah. you're you're done. Like right. if it's a Facebook page that does like a spammy post like that, just for the clicks or whatever, like I'm gone. I unfollow you. You're done. You violated so, the rule. Yeah, yeah, and that's even just for like random, bit like you know news sources where like their job is to be clickbaity for if you're a business and you're trying to build like build a blog for you know if we're nomra we have a blog and all of our clients and all of our potential referral partners are reading that blog we don't want to be like i'd rather it grow slower sure and actually sure. be good quality information that they can look back on even three four years from now than having everybody start saying like oh it's a bunch of bs like they're just pumping out blogs you know what i mean that's right. not what you want so no no not at all and if you if it's something that someone could literally go back to three mm-hmm. or four years that's wonderful yeah because that means you've really covered the foundation yeah. of what you're delivering and i've written one blog and i'm very proud that it still holds up it was just a content marketing overall like be consistent and Mm -hmm. it's brick by brick. It's a slow process, but it's tried and true and it works and just keep posting videos. And that's how your digital presence gets stronger. Mm -hmm. Briley systems. Oh, Oh, Um, okay. Gavin Livingstone. Yes. Yep. Yes. Mm -hmm. He said, I want a social media marketing blog on my website. And I wrote one for him. Like when we first started Mm. and I still look back at it and I'm like, it's still It's still super accurate. Good. So, Yep. I mean, back to basics. Yeah. This is, <laughs> it, communications can get very complicated, you know, when you throw all kinds of technology into it. But the story is the story. And that's yep. really what people still look for. That's, yep. That really hasn't changed. Yep. I love it. All right. Let's uh, see what's, what's left. Anything else that you want to cover? I feel like we're doing pretty well. I think uh, one thing I'd love to talk about just briefly is, that communicating goes two ways. There's external communications to customers, but there's internal communications to your employees. And that's something else that ChoiceWords offers because the messaging is just as critical, if not more, to the people inside your business. In a way, they're your first customers. And if you are not communicating to them in a way that makes sense to them, that's motivating, um, you're not gonna see the same levels of retention and right now, nobody wants to lose employees because it's so hard to get good ones. Uh, and you want to be consistent in what your customers are hearing, whether it's from your sales department or other parts of your organization. So that's another way of thinking about communications. And I, I think people tend to think, you know, outbound, outward. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's just as important for a business to make sure that they're communicating with their frontline people. Mm-hmm. Um, clearly, concisely, in a compelling way. Right. And, and you have got that extra layer where you as a manager need to, to communicate that you care, mm-hmm. that you, it really matters what they're doing um, and that you care about that. Yeah, that's such an underrated point because we end up finding at the root of deeper marketing conversations with some clients that maybe they need to shift their marketing towards their employees. Like if they're a larger company and they're just (laughs) trying to, they're trying to build morale or they're trying Mm -hmm. to, or like consolidate their, like you said, sales communications, Mm -hmm. sometimes shifting what they're putting out on social media shifts the narrative of everybody within the company because they realize, Oh, that's who we are. Right. It wasn't that 
like those old crappy posts. It's like, we are elite. We are, you know, this, that, the other thing. So that's huge. And yeah. so often we find through those deeper conversations that the, the audience that you thought was your audience mm -hmm. really is not your top priority audience. And sometimes you need to shift your marketing focus a little bit, even if it's only short term to mm -hmm. like just write, write the ship a little bit, yeah. depending on you know, whether, whatever the weak point is. But I would actually uh, push against that a little bit, Russ, because employee communications should never be short term. It needs to be just like with your prospective customers, mm -hmm. consistent. Um, they're going to get very suspicious if you all of a sudden start communicating with them and then you stop. <laughs> True. What is that saying? Yeah. Um, nature abhors a vacuum and employees are like anybody else. They're going to fill in the blanks and it may not be with the information or the tone that you want to be communicating. So mm -hmm. it's important to be consistent, even if it's just once a month, but it's, yep. that is pretty critical. So it's, it's the same philosophy is trying to communicate with your customers or your prospective customers. Yep. I love that. How do you, or I, I'm wondering if it's similar because a lot of times we have to tell clients, like, let's start with what you can do honestly on a regular basis, even if it is only a video a month. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. sure. And just start there. Cause at least that's what people will get used to seeing you put out mm -hmm. and they're not going to be expecting more like, right. great, do that for six months and then do two a month and then do three a month over time, but mm -hmm. don't overcommit and say, you're going to come out with like a new video every day. And then you do that for three weeks and it fizzles out. That's way worse than just taking it slow and inching your way up volume wise. And it's just going to burn you out, you or whoever supervising that process. Because typically, you know, I may start working with a business owner, but eventually if I'm going to be handed off to someone else in the organization and you don't want to be burning them out in just countless reviewing, you've got to have some kind of a process that's humane. So, yep. Awesome. Uh, anything else you want to talk about before we go into the web 3.0 exciting Ooh. stuff? No, I think I've covered, uh, I've hopefully tried to communicate the value of words, uh, yeah. carefully chosen words. Yep. I think that's been a success and it's a great preface to what we're going to talk about now Sure. <laughs> and why this is such an interesting conversation to keep an eye on. So for those of you who don't know or aren't aware of what chat GPT is, um, Google it and make an account, play around with it. Did you play around with it? Actually, chat GPT is oversubscribed uh, and they have overloaded. a completely um, refreshing version of how they explain to people that they're, they're too busy. They're trying to, it, <laughs> yeah. you know, they're oversubscribed. You can read it as a Shakespearean uh, style. <laughs> you can read it like a video script. Uh, you can read it, you know, essentially in any style that you want, but which makes the point of what they're trying what to does, do. Yeah. 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 So brief sort of explanation of what this thing is. And it, it really, no sort of explanation can do it justice until you play around with it. But you, you go into chat GPT. It's an artificial intelligence search engine that does anything you tell it to do. If you tell it to write a thousand words on the production of potatoes and whatever state, like it will do that. If you tell it to write that same essay in the voice of Shakespeare, it'll do that. If you tell it to write a rap song about that subject, it'll do that. And every variation, like you can conversate with it and give it directions. And it's very, very interesting. A lot of coders are using it to write code and repair their current code on their websites, which is like, I mean, pretty mind blowing yeah. when you consider it's, it's just artificial intelligence. There's no person behind the scenes doing it. And it spits out the answers in a matter of seconds. Yeah. Um, so it's an interesting thing. And obviously it has a lot of people in our community talking about what this means for copywriting, right? Yes. Cause you can say, Hey, write me a blog on this mm -hmm. and it, it will, it will, well, let's talk about it. <laughs> so it will, but right now um, it's not connected to the internet. So chat GPT I think is delighting in, in the open AI is the company behind it, delighting in the fact that they have too many people participating because every single request they get is adding into their own database. So you can write something in the style of Shakespeare because somebody at some point plugged into their database, all of Shakespeare's works. Mm -hmm. So they can do that. 
But if I ask them to write a blog in the voice of one of my clients, and she hasn't been throwing things into chat GPT, right. or uh, the content of her website hasn't been loaded in, mm -hmm. they're really not going to be able to reproduce that voice. And so it works up to a point, yep. but it's you know like anything that's got a computer behind it, what goes in, the quality of what goes in is, determines the quality of what comes out. And I think, because I have seen it operate, um, even though I couldn't get in, I watched other people and I've read about it. And it's a great first draft. Mm -hmm. It's better than a usual first draft. Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't have sources. And so it's drawing on what it's been told. Um, so you don't have that opportunity from what it gives you to think, this is solid. This is backed up by data, research. Right. I can just go with it. You've got to double check it. And frankly, it needs editing. Now, you can tell it to edit it, mm -hmm. but if what you tell it is to please write it in the voice of, you know, client X, right. that isn't something they can actually do. Right. So unless client X is a like well known billionaire person. Right. You know what I mean? Then right. sure. But most of our clients, that's not going to be possible. They're hardworking small business owners who have not spent much time playing around with chat GPT. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I think anybody who's wondering, I wanted to bring that up and we wanted to touch on that because it's a super hot topic right now. And sure. I think a lot of people are potentially going to go down the wrong path and overuse it too early. Right. And yeah. so what we've told our team is let's keep an eye on it. Yeah. Like first draft, great for you know, taking away the writer's block if you're really having a hard time. Yeah. But double check everything. Like, well, you don't know if that's even correct or not. Like, it sure. looks great in, you know, formulating a sentence and it, it looks like a good paragraph or a good honest caption or a good honest blog, mm -hmm. but it still needs to be written by the human being who actually knows the business. Right. And like, the, nothing really is ever going to be able to fully replace that until we start you know, until every client has a podcast and everybody's personality is uploaded and fine. Right. <laughs> and we're, and we're living 20, our digital lives. Right. You know. And we're all uploaded to meta and, right. you know, right. communicating from our little bubbles. We have plugs in the back <laughs> of our brain. Right. Yeah. Then it'll get to that point. But I think that's important for people to, to Absolutely. be aware of is like that. It, it feels like you could use it every day, but you can't yet. No, it's way too early of a technology. It's super cool, super, super fun. It's like a toy almost when it yeah. like when it comes to writing stuff. And it's it's genuinely fun and enjoyable to be like, will it do this? Like, mm -hmm. can I get it to write about this or that? But then you ask it the weather and it doesn't know the weather because it's not connected to the Internet or right. like real world actual information. Right. They had so. a great example on their website about um, Christopher Columbus coming to visit the United <laughs> States in 2015 and the earlier version of ChatGPT um, basically had three very vague sentences about the fact that he arrived in the U.S. in 2015. The new version said, well, this really couldn't happen because he came in 1492, so they knew that much. Okay. Um, and then they went on a sort of couple of paragraphs about how he'd be surprised at what's changed, but he'd also be surprised at how he's perceived now. And so it was nuanced in that way. But again, it didn't have any sources. Right. It was a lot of sort of generalizations. Yep. Um, but it was right up front addressing the fact that this is not possible. This couldn't, he couldn't be here in 2015. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Which they didn't know in an earlier version. Yeah. And that's what we sort of want to keep an eye on is how is it learning? How is it continuing to be programmed over the years? You know, yeah. it's going to keep getting better. They, they said once it's connected to the internet, it could be 500 times smarter than it is now. And then it'll learn on top of that. Right. So who knows? But, Yes. But everything on the internet isn't true either. If so it's anybody learning, learning from, from, the, from internet. the internet, <laughs> that's my it's, biggest concern too. <laughs> yeah. I mean, unless the people who are training the AI programs, because there were humans involved yeah, right sure. from the beginning of creating this, if they help it learn to discern you know, what we desperately try and teach children in school, how to figure out an accurate website from one that is a little bit sketchy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if AI can figure that out and be discerning, okay, then it's 500 times smarter in a good way. Right. As opposed to just regurgitating <laughs> yeah. all of the stuff that's on the internet. That yeah. Really. 
which that could be just be a disaster in the wrong direction. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. Well, chat GPT, keep an eye on it. That's Absolutely. really all we can say. It's a great way to get over what you were calling writer's block. I think of as sort of blank page paralysis, mm-hmm. You're staring at a screen and you just don't know where to start. Fine. You know, get it started that yeah. way. Um, but you have to realize that's not the end of it. Yeah. So. Yep. Awesome. Well, anything else you can think of before we uh, wrap it up? I think we did what we accomplished, which is like really bring light to how important choice words are. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. People really um, don't think about in their day-to-day lives the power that words can have. Uh, but uh, really, you listen to a great speech uh, and today we're celebrating Martin Luther King's birthday and his words still resonate, you know, decades later. And I think that if you can find the words that resonate, and it doesn't have to be in a speech given to millions, but that resonate for the people you really want to be talking to, you'll get a response that you're looking for. They'll get excited. They want to take action. Um, and hopefully they're thinking, I want to hear more. I want to see what else this person has to tell me because what I've heard so far just gets me so excited. Awesome. I think that's a great way to end it. Thank you so much, Allison, for coming on. Thanks for coming. Uh, We'll have you on again soon, I hope. Thank you very much, Russ. This has been fun. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. See you next time.